Hello, my name is Jason Reichel, and you're listening to Risk Management Brick by Brick. I'm fascinated with people who are helping build and maintain the physical world around us. On each episode of this podcast, we'll dive in with a risk manager, speak to them about how technology plays a role in this process. Today's guest is Diana Rich, Director of Risk Management for Foundation Building Materials. Diana is a seasoned risk management professional who has developed and managed insurance programs for several industries. The scope of her responsibilities have included selecting and managing partners for all lines of insurance, negotiating premiums, and collaborating in the design and implementation of risk management information systems. That sounds like a lot. It is because Diana is a true pro. Let's get to it. Hello. Thank you for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing terrific. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Over the course of making this podcast, I have been really interested in asking people in risk management, and I've gotten a variety of answers, but why is risk management important to the building of the world? Like, why is it actually important? Risk management is really everything that we do. Just people don't call it that, and we've developed some specialized terminology to address the way that we handle perils that we ensure them, that we try and prevent them. But really, everything you do, you're a risk manager. Am I going to jump in the deep end of the pool without a life vest? Am I going to throw somebody in there without a life vest? Am I going to cross the street here, or am I going to use the sidewalk? So we are (laughs) constantly in our lives analyzing risk and deciding what's acceptable. And in some ways, I think risk managers are better at it. Nobody jaywalks as well as a risk manager (laughs) because We see the risks, we know what we're facing, and off we go. But everything everybody does every day is protecting our assets. Risk management just has a larger scope where we're protecting the assets of our organization. I love that. I love that you just connected it to the true human experience, which is we're always looking at risk from all sorts of perspectives. And risk management is a practice of exploring that in the space of business or in the space of construction or wherever we're talking about. Were you always the risk manager in elementary school? Like, give me a little bit about how you got to where you're at and if this was a natural fit for you or if it was a a taught skill. I think in some ways it's a natural fit. I come from a, a family with a very strong engineering bent. So I have a very curious mind. My dad was always working in the garage, always tinkering with things. We were riding motorized equipment. I had a little go-kart that I was riding when I was four years old. So from an early age, we were taught how to be around machinery. And I think what I have found is taking that mechanical approach to solving business problems, business safety issues, we need to get this from here to there. I take it apart and I look at the pieces and I see, do they fit back together better? I think my background in claims really helped me with that analytical process because you sort of see at the end of the day what went wrong and you can sort of work backwards in time to see where those moments were, those laps, those laps in judgment moments, right? Like if you're going backwards from the claim. Yeah, the direct causal connection, where things went wrong or how many things went wrong at once. I always love when I have someone with the full breadth of experience when I was recording the intro you really are someone who's touched every aspect of this landscape. Can you just kind of give the audience listening sort of a 10,000 foot view of your career and where you are now? I got into insurance like very many of my peers, which is I needed a job. This company had an opening and I ended up being hired as a unit assistant for a liability claims team at Aetna. And this was way back in the old days when it was okay to haze newcomers and (laughs) the crusty old claims adjusters who are probably younger than I am now thought it was really funny to send the new girl over to the file cabinets to look up, oh, go find this claim for me and look in there and see if there's a piece of paper. Well, that particular file would have a very gory picture in it. And they did that to try and shock us. And I would kind of look at it like, oh, this is awful. I wonder how this happened. So I think it kind of fed on my curiosity. I'm not a particular genius in any one subject, but what I really liked about my role and what I've been able to learn is that I need to know a little bit about a lot of different things. And that really appeals to my natural sense of curiosity. I get to research, I get to learn, I get to figure out how did what I just learned about no-cut gloves allow me to protect our workers on the job. 
how can I make good decisions? And that's just one of many areas I've gotten to know. I have to know a little bit about law. I have to know about medicine. I have to know about contracts, negotiation skills. So it's, to me, claims, underwriting, and then taking that further into risk management where you can actually directly apply it is really, I think, an underappreciated profession. There are a lot of very clever people out there that I think would be a good fit. For example, I've always said if I'm going to start a claims adjusting company, I would go to Verizon and I would hire all the people in the sales room (laughs) because they're curious. They're not afraid of tech. They're not afraid to talk to people. They look for solutions. And I think those are the kind of people that might be the future of risk management. I think so too. To make a little bit of a sideways thing, one of the things when I'm talking to people that they keep bringing up is the fear of the future of risk management as people in risk management are aging up and not as many people are coming into it and the influx of technology sort of playing a key role in that to try to augment that fact that there's not as many risk managers. D, I'm so curious because the way that you just framed that, if I was 22 years old, would sell me, like sell me that, hey, this is interesting because my big belief in life is being a generalist is more powerful than being a super highly specialized person because you're able to assess situations more holistically. So maybe I'm doing this job now because I'm maybe I was meant to be a risk manager. Maybe that's what I'm learning in the second. But for you, do you feel like the industry is having a shortage of new risk managers coming in and really taking on the industry and taking on the role? I think there is. So I'm sitting in Orange County, California. Our risk management group here, the ones that participate in our local risk and insurance management society, we tend to come from organizations that have small risk management departments. Many of my peers, there's one or two people. I have three people total in my department. And so I'm looking and and it's hard to have an opportunity to mentor and bring new people in. With the Cal State Fullerton School for Risk Management and Insurance, there's actually now a degree program for risk management. I've been participating with them for a number of years. And it's kind of sad that we just don't have enough pure risk management openings. Most of the students end up going to insurance companies or brokers, get some experience, get exposed to a number of industries, and then they can decide to move into risk management. Risk management profession, I think, is really underappreciated within organizations. A lot of people are relying on their insurance brokers or attorneys to give them advice. And I think that they're missing out on some key aspects of what risk managers can bring. And some of that stuff you can only learn by doing. You can't take a college course. I mean, it can be a competitive advantage, right? It Mm -hmm. can be something that really drives us. I'm so curious, just because you just mentioned this, but what's the advantage of having risk management in-house versus, and I'm probably going to get my hands slapped for this because you know we work with so many brokers and I have broker friends, but versus having a brokerage be that risk manager for you and having no risk manager in-house? I think the advantage is is where I can get embedded and help mold the culture. Safety is always number one. Everybody says, yeah, I want to be safe, but they want to be safe until it costs them too much money. And I think from an external perspective, you're getting advice from somebody who's not really embedded in your business Are they going to be as trustworthy? Are they going to understand the nuances and maybe look for ways to make it work? Maybe you don't do it through one department. Maybe you get two departments to team up. And I think an outside consultant would have a little bit of trouble with that. Good risk managers recognize the value that brokers bring. And I do use services from my broker for loss control, risk financing, and other things. So I end up in some ways sort of being the conductor of the orchestra presenting this ballad of risk management and ways to protect my company. Yeah, we have similar positions. As a CRO, my job is not to be the head of sales or the head of marketing or the head of customer success. I have to orchestrate all of those departments to be successful because it's all revenue that our organization we're trying to capture. And it sounds, and I really love this analogy, that it's similar to be a risk manager across everything. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about the role that technology plays, in the next 10 years, what are your bets around technology? What do you think technology should either innovate further on or perfect? Where is your relationship with technology as a risk manager in 2022? There's technology. We, I sit in front of a computer all day. I'm using the whole suite of office products. 
So there's one aspect of technology that I think has significantly changed how we do business. Few less layers, fewer layers in an organization means you can get to the key people faster. So that part of technology, I think every aspect of business has experienced, and I think that's going to keep going on. There's other technology that sometimes is just a bright, shiny object. It's just distracting from what you need to do. It doesn't help you achieve your goals. The best technology is technology that is actually a tool that you can use to turn data into information. And how do you do that? Well, there's analytics. We've installed our fleet with telematics. So we were able to analyze accidents, take our maintenance information, automate it, make sure that our trucks get repaired. That kind of technology is the stuff that I'm always looking for. How can we do things better, faster, cheaper, and not just for the sake of doing something, not just for playing with the shiny object, but for having something actually that we can actually deploy and use across our platform. Zooming in a little bit, what, like, one of the in construction, in industry, when you have subcontractors or parties that you work with who work on your behalf, that experience hasn't always been great, right? That, like, I worked for a competitor in the procurement space and having a subcontractor fill out all their forms and submit that to the organization. It's like going into document hell, you're asking someone who, repairs floors or does plumbing or does something very specific to go into a world they're not really that familiar with and invest time and energy into it. And I understand why that's important, but what's your perspective on the relationship that an organization should have with its subcontractors? What should they be doing to make sure that those people are happy? What's your level of quality that you expect to give to those subcontractors? That's a really good question. And I think Going back to my earlier comment about it, kind of an engineering bend of mind, how can I take these tools, whether they're electronic, paper, whatever, and make them easier for people to use and access? And that's always an objective of mine. And my attitude is really that these subcontractors are customers of ours, and I need to practice good customer service with them. If they need something, I need to be able to get it to them. It needs to be easy for them to understand and follow. In exchange, and this is a philosophy I practice with everybody I do business with, if I expect high standards, I need to be prepared to be the best customer too. I need to pay my bills on time. I need to answer claims adjusters' questions. With our subcontractors, I just talked to one the other day, and he says, yeah, I'm anxious to work with you guys because you guys pay me right away. Other companies take 45 days to pay, and yeah, the work is good, but I can't wait that long. So we're paying them right away. That builds that loyalty. And to use kind of a recent buzzword, it makes us sticky, right? We become more attractive to our employees because we provide a safe environment to our subcontractors, to our customers, because they know that they can rely on us. I think that's a goal. Yeah, that's definitely a goal. I am so interested in how do you monitor, like as a risk manager, your processes and where the risk lies? I had a risk manager on here a few weeks ago who said, every business has a risk appetite. And if you kill all risk, then you have no business. So you have to open yourself up to risk in order to conduct business, to live in the world. We all know that. We all know, just to your first metaphor, that we're humans and we're walking around every day and there's risks all around us. What is your strategy for determining what is an acceptable risk and what is not an acceptable risk? Analyzing information. I look at our claims history. Foundation Building Materials is 11 years old. So we've got some history. I've been here for eight and a half of those, pretty much since we were of any significant size. So I have a lot of claims information I can draw upon, a lot of customer information. I look at that, where, where have there been trends? I go through once a month, I pick a subject, like how many injuries are happening for our employees with less than 12 months of service versus more than 12 months of service? How many injuries are happening at our union shops, our peace rate shops, or our regular shops? Can I drill in on some things there? Are there common traits? I'm partnering with our broker right now to do a employee safety survey, and we're gearing this towards the difference between branches who for the last three years had no recordable workers' comp claims versus branches for the last three years have had more, right? Can we look and dig in and see if there's some common element there? And by constantly evaluating what we're doing, looking at lagging indicators, I think we can create leading indicators 
which is really where the future of our safety program needs to keep focusing. If we do pre-delivery job site assessments, we're reducing claims. I'm measuring about a 35% reduction year over year in our at-fault auto accidents because we are effectively using our telematic system to coach our employees. We get an employee point score for safe driving. Every month, the top drivers are getting a $50 gift card for achieving that score. So there's ways to take safety information and put it to the use of the organization overall in in achieving its goals. Safer driving means we're delivering product more safely. We don't have downtime from accidents. We can better serve our customers and make us more money, which is really what it's all about at the end of the day. So if I had to paraphrase that, because I just am so fascinated by so many things you just said, it's like firing off all these signals in my brain. It's data science because you're taking these things and you're making a data hypothesis about where these milestones might be. Then you're asking your data that. You're coming back to see if there's any correlation, right? Then you're putting leading indicators in, which act as a training mechanism. And then you're slightly modifying behaviors with tools or processes in order to then see if that comes back and your data actually changes, right? You are, man, like, this sounds dumb, but you gave such a beautiful outline of this that many people don't give. That's what risk management means. It's understanding the identification, changing the behaviors, to get better outcomes on the other end of it, which is just a fascinating way of looking at that. And your method for like constant improvement of your program is also, I think, very approachable, but also I don't know a lot of organizations that are doing that. Maybe a claim happens, which is already too late. And then they use that claim to then change elements of their risk program. And I just love the way that you were talking about how you proactively improve your program? Well, I'll give you just a quick example. We know that just OSHA statistics countrywide, new employees, less than 12 years with that employer, not in the business, but that employer are 35 to 40% more likely to have an on-the-job injury that first year. So what we've done is our new employees get a green hard hat and they wear that for the first year. And the idea is that you're going to see somebody with a green hard hat It's going to create awareness in the crew that you've got somebody new. But we also emphasize this is somebody new. This is somebody that you can get to know, that you can introduce to our culture, that you can help mentor to be a valuable member of our company for years to come with the green hard hat. Because otherwise, you're a new person, you're kind of invisible. Now you're green hard hat. Well, hey, I got a green hard hat. Everybody's nice to me. I love this place. I'm going to work here forever. Yeah. And that's how you build, I think, a productive and cohesive workforce. I was in a cooking seminar in Mexico City a few weeks ago, and we were doing very complex things, knife skills and stuff like that. Totally fine because everyone knew that I was not a trained chef. They were watching my knife skills. If I was making a mistake, they were helping me correct the mistakes. I wasn't frustrated because I was actually gaining new skills by this attention that maybe I initially didn't want on me, you know, in that moment. I came home, was making one of the dishes by myself, knife skill. I cut my hand really bad and had to get five stitches before going to Friendsgiving with my friends, right? And I think that just goes to how behavior can change based on the scenario and how calling out certain elements of risk actually helps the entire system. It's so relatable to your very first idea about us as human beings and and the need to control these things in order to drive really positive outcomes. And knowing our environment, I'm going to give you one more quick story. I was comp manager for a public sector insurance pool. Okay. So I was just curious because I'm new to public sector never have handled claims for firefighters. I was just curious, how often do they get burned when they're working a fire? So I picked one of our entities, member city that had 60 claims. And I was looking through and I did a word search on the description. How many burn claims were there? There was one burn claim and it was from a fire captain taking cookies out of the oven. (laughs) And I was like, I boggled my mind. And I sat back and thought, well, they're training all the time for putting out fires for running the trucks, putting up the hoses, the ladders, going into burning buildings, okay? Their awareness is up. They know, hey, I'm walking into danger. I'm going to be hyper alert. When did they get hurt? Back in the station. They tripped over the exhaust hose. They'd miss a step. 
they got burned taking cookies out of the oven. Their guard was down. They thought, oh, this is a safe environment. I know what I'm doing now. I don't have to worry because there's not a big dinosaur going to come and eat me. But And that's when they got hurt. So when you're talking about training, you can't just train for the really hazardous things. You have to train to make sure that they're constantly aware of hazards, ever-present hazards. And again, back to human beings, risk managers, we're assessing danger all the time. Taking your green hat thing, it's not just that they're new, so they're at risk. By everyone knowing that they're new, taking more caution around them, they're also paying attention to their own behavior as modeling that, which is first rule of behavioral change. So it's just so fascinating, these micro changes, which can have huge impacts both for business. And I think it's one of the reasons why I do believe that risk management is such an underrated field role to be in because it is truly like having someone watching your organization's behaviors and then optimizing them for better outcome. And I don't think that that can be something that you completely outsource or it's something that takes being indoctrinated both into the organization, understanding those behaviors, and then having it one foot maybe out the door, externally understanding what the world around is doing. And I think that's just a fascinating way to approach this whole thing. Last question, what is your future forecast? Where is risk management? Where would you like to see risk management be in, say, 20 years? It's starting to move there with the creation of a chief risk officer as a director position for a lot of organizations. I think there needs to be more integration with operations. I think they need to see risk management more as a way to achieve their goals and less as a way of people just saying, no, you can't do this. That, I don't know if that's going to really be industry-wide thing. To me, that's a battle that has to be fought every day with every regional manager, district manager. You've got to earn your credibility. They've got to understand that you're on their side. They've got to understand that you're making realistic suggestions. Yeah, we're crashing forklifts into things, so I'm going to bubble wrap all the forklifts. Well, that's not going to solve problems. What are other things we can do, right? Let's try and look at those. And I have always loved to go out and do tours of our branches, the job sites. I used to go through factories and back in the 80s, I worked for a broker. I was doing factory tours and I'm I'm toddling along on my little high heels and my little suit and my little blouse with the little bow tie on it going on factory tours. Everything looked dangerous to me because I wasn't prepared. I wasn't adapted to the environment. I wasn't didn't have the right PPE on. I had, I had no idea what the hazards were. And that kind of taught me when we're looking at what's out there in the world, are we prepared? Do we know what we're doing? Do we have the right clothing and equipment? And by providing some of those things to operations, for example, you use this type of no-cut glove versus the other kind, you're actually going to be able to handle product more effectively and quickly. So there's a plus for you. This is actually a safety tool that's going to make your job easier. So I try and look for those kinds of things. And I think that's always going to have to be an objective of risk managers is to look for ways to make themselves relevant to the operation side of the house, not just the finance side. I think it's the future that you laid out, I think with methodology that, that you spoke about, and if people really approach this as a human job, it moves it into where it can be the cross-functional of operations and finance in the controlling mechanism, talking back to that diagram, we're doing this so that we can make better profit, or we're doing this to reduce risk, and reduce claims, but then we're also making people's lives better operationally and more effective so that that we can get better jobs, so that we can have good reputation, so that we can have all of the things that are associated with running a business. And I really hope and I support your vision for the future of risk management. And it was a pleasure having you on the podcast. And I would love to check back in with you in the future and ask you some more questions. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. This was a pleasure to be able to participate. Thank you so much. Have a nice night. Thank you. Risk Management Brick by Brick is brought to you by TrustLayer. Find out how TrustLayer manages risk so that the people can build the physical world around us. Head over to TrustLayer.io and then make sure to subscribe to Risk Management Brick by Brick on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. On behalf of the TrustLayer team, Thank you for listening.